All right, here we go. <laughs> brother Josh, thank you for coming on, brother. Uh, I really, really appreciate you, man. Like, you have no idea how much I'm grateful for you being here. So thank you for coming on, man. But uh, <clears throat> I want to begin with your understanding of the Old Testament and how they were saved. So you you believe that the Old Testament saints before the coming of Christ onto the earth was by faith plus works? Hey, John. Uh, thanks for having me. Appreciate you, brother. You know, I love you. I always want to see you succeed and grow and, you know, all of that. And I like the haircut, too. <laughs> but... Had All to right. get it fixed, brother. <laughs> Had to get it fixed. Hey, sometimes it sometimes you got to do things a couple times before you get it right, you know. Yeah, I'm not doing that again, bro. <laughs> well, you got it right by going to a barber. Yes, but <laughs> that's always the way to go, man. I am never trying to do it myself again. Just so the audience knows, I tried to do my own haircut, so I pulled this razor out and actually tried doing it myself. And uh, let's just say it didn't go too well. <laughs> so I had to get a lot of it heated off. So, but you can continue, brother. Sorry. Yeah, let's 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 um let's explore this a little bit and then kind of see where this takes us. So, there one of the main things that like kind of I try to associate with the the old testament and how old testament saints and how people in the old testament in general are saved um has to do with works plus faith now yeah. in the old testament they had a mechanism that they used well they had several mechanisms that they used for what you would call a covering of sins, right? So we would both agree that in the Old Testament, sins were covered and not taken away, right? <clears throat> to a certain well, extent, or to to a degree, but since I affirm what's called the covering the covenant of grace on reform theology, the, the idea of covenant theology, I believe that the covenant of grace was still a thing even before Christ came. And so I would still say, even though they weren't saved by the blood of the bulls and goats, that they were saved by looking to what those bulls and goats pointed to, right? They were foreshadows of Christ. So for my view, I would say they weren't saved by the blood. They were saved by looking forward to the Messiah that we look back to. So it's sense? not it's not a preterist approach, is it? That's not unique to preterism, no. Because a preterist would say that Christ was already crucified since Adam and Eve, right? Well, I don't know if they would say that, uh, but because preterist is more specifically regarding how you view the tribulation. And the end times more precisely, not necessarily the death of Christ, but yeah. Uh, for your question, though, like how, how do we take that? I just think that it's the the death of Christ that has saved everyone before and after cross. And so the Old Testament saints, on my view. We're saved on the same basis that we are, by faith alone. So I would say that when we look to Abraham, for example, Abraham is said to have believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. What were you talking about? Hebrews 11? <clears throat> Specifically Romans 4, because I think Romans 4 is what gives the argument that were saved on the same basis as Abraham was, which was by faith apart from works. Romans 4 what? 
Well, if you want, we can walk through the text if you're interested. I, can I have it open the text here. Out. Okay. Uh, Romans 4, we can start in verse 1. <laughs> so what then uh, shall... Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, do you want me to read out of the King James Version, brother? You can read anything you got. I'm looking at the NIV. Okay. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, his wage is not counted according to grace, but according to what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes upon him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks the blessing on the man to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. And then he cites those passages in the Old Testament. <clears throat> Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. And so this is all in reference to Abraham, right? He's saying, how was Abraham justified? Well, he was justified by faith apart from works. And you see this in verse 9. Therefore, is this blessing on the circumcised or the uncircumcised also? For we say, faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? And his answer is very peculiar. He says, not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all those who believe without being circumcised, that righteousness might be counted to them, and the father of circumcision to those who not only are the of the circumcision, but who also follow in the steps of the faith of our father Abraham, which he had while uncircumcised. <clears throat> it's very interesting when you see this, because Paul says, that Abraham is our forefather according to the faith, right? And he is the father of all who believe. And so we're saved on the same basis that he was. He was saved by faith apart from works before he was circumcised, right? This was before the law. And yep. then he uses that as the picture of how we are to be justified before God by faith and and not by works. And so we could go through more of that, but I would love to hear your thoughts on that, brother. So here's the thing that the argument is that it is faith alone in the old Testament. Now, yeah. We have some issues with that because we have clear examples of works that had they not been done, the Messianic Christ would have never been born out of that, right? So if we look at Matthew, we say that Matthew uh, 117, and this is NIV, so... Just assume it's all corrupted and spelled incorrectly and everything. <laughs> but we'll, we'll go with it. It says, Thus there were 14 generations in all from Adam, from Abraham to David. 14 from David to the exile of Babylon. And 14 from the exile to Christ. Right? So yeah. what, what happened between Abraham and Christ? Well, a lot happened. But more specifically, what happened with Abraham? Right? Because see... Abraham, Isaac was not his first son, right? Right. It was uh, Ishmael? Yeah. Now, Ishmael um, was basically like that bastard child that, um, you know, kind of 
the child of disobedience per se right because yeah. when god makes you a promise you you can either wait for god to fulfill the promise or take matters into your own hands and that's what we saw happen with abraham you know he was getting impatient he's not seeing how and when he would be the father of many nations yeah. um and there was a lack of faith so that is what resulted in him sleeping with the what is it the the maid or the, i can't remember exactly what she was but it wasn't his wife um and then that produced ishmael so we know that ishmael is not where the descendants that lead up to christ come from right we know that that came from the line of isaac so yeah. we have an example there of somebody who was weak in faith i'm not going to say they didn't have faith i'm going to say weak in faith and was doing works according to the flesh that's what i'm going to say um, and the reason I'm saying that is because, as I mentioned earlier, he took matters into his own hands rather than waiting for God to to complete the promise. He said, well, maybe this is what God wanted me to do. Maybe maybe this is how God wants me to do it. Now, see, I believe that that God is. Um, is is uh, unlike calvinism and we'll just kind of start like kind of leaning into that as, as we kind of go um it, it would just um and maybe it's maybe it's not maybe it is calvinism maybe it's not and you kind of let me know what you think about that here in a second but sure if the if the predetermination aspect is what would make it calvinism right so this is what people argue that god is all knowing god is the author of all he planned everything not, nothing catches God by surprise, right? And I agree. I agree to all these things. But for knowledge and post-knowledge, I don't believe that that necessarily equates to the predetermination. Yeah. It's like, I agree. Well, well, I took my dog out into the forest and I shot him in the head and the dog died. So I knew that I was going to go out there and shoot him in the head because he had rabies. So... Therefore, I am the author of that dog's life. So this is the kind of where I, I draw the line. So see what what the Calvinists would have to argue, and we'll try to keep this with faith plus works as well, um, yeah. is that God predetermined Abraham to produce Ishmael before Isaac. Now, I would uh -huh. argue that that's just a product of Abraham's disobedience. That's that's what I would argue, and and you might even be able to affirm that from the Calvinist perspective if you're trying to use compatibilism to kind of tie that all together. But what I'm saying is that it required Abraham to then be obedient, right and you, you, some people may not consider obedience a type of work, um, but I'm I would, finally calling it a work. By yeah, way. no, but I, but I would argue that you know it it it, 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 it might as well be, you know, right. So, in and and with Abraham specifically, this is like detrimental to the salvation of everyone. When I say faith plus works, it's not just. It's not just um, Abraham's individual uh, s salvation, but had Abraham been disobedient even further and, and have more children with other women other than his wife because he refuses to believe that God can make her bear a child at the age of 100, however old she was at that time. I think she was pretty high up there. Um, yeah, they both laughed at the idea. Yeah, and 
you know, so, and then sure enough, like a son was produced, right? Yeah. So my main thing with this is that had there not been the work, which is the obedience to what God has called you to do, rather than how you want to make the puzzle pieces fit together because you feel like God's plan isn't working. So I need to take matters into my own hands. Um, then we would not have those generations leading up to Christ. Right. If, if, if mm -hmm. Abraham say, I mean, say for example, if Abraham didn't have any faith and didn't produce any works. And as a result, Isaac was never born then where do we get the 14 generations from Abraham to David, the 14 generations from David to exile, and the 14 generations from exile to Christ? If you cut it off at the very beginning of the timeline, what God would have to do, right? Plan B. It, go ahead. Right. Then, at that point, it would have to be plan B. That's yeah. where I would say I think predestination answers a lot of this. <laughs> Because God determined that Abraham would be obedient such that the line would happen this way. Right? Obviously, I don't believe that conflicts with freedom because I'm a compatibilist. But the point being, so I think what, I have a good answer for this. What would you say is my answer? What, what do you think my answer would be to that? Uh, to combat compatibilism on that? Or your view of how the line was so, passed down. So you said it would either go to plan B or it would further affirm God's decree that Abraham would be obedient. So how do you think I would respond to that? And then I'll tell you what I think. Um, I don't know. <laughs> well, it's simple. You can, you can let me know. It, yeah, it's simple. God knew Abraham would be obedient. Right. That doesn't mean that God made it it. so Abraham would be obedient, yeah. which is the Calvinist perspective. So your point is foreknowledge and predestination aren't the same thing, basically. Yeah. So. Okay. Can I explain to you my argument in response to that? Because I understand what you're saying there, and I, I actually agree. Foreknowledge and predestination are the same thing. But I do believe that there's there becomes a problem when it comes into creation. <clears throat> do you believe, and I promise I'm not trying to get a rabbit show right now, but do you believe that God knew what would happen when he decided to create this world this way. So before he decided to create, before he said, you know, let there be light, before he said, uh, you know, before he created the heavens and the earth, did he know what would happen as a result of him creating that world that way? Um, so we look at, um, I always go to Genesis 2, 17, mm -hmm. and this is uh, NIV again, so just assume it's wrong. <laughs> um, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will surely die. So does that verse there lead you to believe that God has foreknowledge that they will eat from it? Or is it, or you think that it is um, um, not a threat, not a warning. There's another word, but along those lines. Well, I, I know that text, that text isn't necessarily addressing omniscience at that point, but uh he is expecting them to do it 
in that. He, he's saying, when you do this, you will surely die. So I would say that that's evidence that he knew that they would. Uh, I wouldn't use that as an argument for God's omniscience, but I would say that that's something you could take from it. Okay. Now, would you then further go on and say that God decreed them to eat from the tree? Mm -hmm. It was all so, according to his plan. Um, give me one quick second, okay? I'm going to mute myself. You're fine, brother. Okay, sorry, John. Um, You're fine, brother. Okay, so, yeah. So, it just seems um, that, and this is where I have a, an issue with saying that God made it so that things would fall apart so that they can be put back together, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, if I'm at the beach and I'm building a sandcastle, Right, I want to build this big sandcastle. Um, seems counterintuitive if I'm all nip, all omnipotent, all knowing. You, you know, for me to create it in a way so that it falls apart just to start over again, it it would seem that why not get it right the first time, right? So with the with my position that God doesn't decree everything that man has the ability to make decisions on their own and as a result of that that brings consequences and i think the scripture tells us that it says because one man's sin entered the world and that's adam right yeah they ate from that tree which they were told not to eat of and and not only do I I believe that not only were they told not to eat of it, but there was an indication to to show in scripture that God may have known that they were going to. Yeah. Uh, uh, so go ahead. Well, I would I love to explain this because I think there's a very good reason why he did plan it. And I would say it's actually for his own glory. Because when he decided to create, he wanted to glorify himself in displaying all of his attributes, which includes his love in wanting to show his grace and mercy upon undeserving sinners. And he wanted to display his wrath in justly condemning those who were disobedient to him. Right. So the only way to do that is if man fell in Adam. Because if there was no fall, there would be no way for him to be savior. Right? And with the fall, brings into the world the reality that we needed a savior. Right? That we have fallen short of God's law, and we need to be saved from our sin. And so from my perspective, I would say that's why he planned it this way. 
because he wanted to glorify himself in saving us and condemning the disobedient. And that's exactly what he's done. That way, he glorifies himself in displaying all of his attributes, not just his just condemnation, but also his gracious, undeserving grace that he has bestowed on us to save us from our sin. Does that make sense? Well, what you're saying is that God let man fall so then he can later come and save them. Right, because if there is no fall, there is nothing to be saved from. Okay, but this begs the question. If God simply wanted to prove that he could take a degenerate person and regenerate them, he could have done that with the fallen angels. Why not? Why create a well, whole other category of existence when you already have a group of people who have left their first estate, right? They left before humans were created, right? So mm -hmm. God already had a vessel for which to show his glory with. He right, and that's why I, I answered it very precisely. He wanted to do that with men who were created in his image, right? The angels were not created in the image of God in the way that we are, right? We are unique from the angels and from every other created thing because we are made according to his likeness. That's what makes humans unique from everything else. And so he wanted to show his glory in saving mankind from their sins does that make sense so it's it's very don't, specific it's it's not saving well the angels from their rebellion don't you think that your position creates this self-centered egotistic god i don't think so well i mean why not it's like well i'm gonna do this simply to prove that i can fix it who are you proving it to? The only other people around are angels. Well, remember. The Does he have another God that he needs to report to or something? Well, no. <laughs> he and That's just his desire to, to show his glory in his creation. And that's something we partake in and we will be enjoying with him in eternity. Right? We will look at everything he has done and rejoice with him. In everything he has done for his own glory and so this isn't something that I think should be contested that's even true on non Calvinist views that we are part of his creative story and when we enter eternity a lot of those questions we have for God he can answer because he has purposes for all of them and I'm sure you have questions for God that you want answered. And the whole point of Isaiah 40 through 48 just is that God can answer those questions for us because he has purposes for everything that happens. And so on my view, <clears throat> that's, that's what it means that God has planned all of this. That God has a purpose and all of this wickedness that happens to show his own glory. Wouldn't it? <laughs> and that's a beautiful thing, isn't it? Yeah, but I would just argue that. See, what do you think is harder? To hit a sitting duck or a moving target? Well, uh, a moving target, of course. Okay. Right. So if God purpose was to show his glory then you create a scenario where he's shooting at a sitting duck see when you have the free will of man then what you're then what essentially what god is doing at that point is chasing a moving target and i think it would bring more glory to god 
to be able to show that even when man falls short, God is somehow able to work that for his good. And I think that's what he's doing on Reformed Theology, that he has decided to use the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Right? We just have a different understanding of who will believe and why they believe. But the the same point is true on non-Calvinist views, right? That God has decided to glorify himself in saving a people, no matter how you think he has done that. Whether you think he elected unconditionally, whether or not you think predestination is true, those are different questions, right? But when it comes to his intention in saving, that is a glorious reality that all of us rejoice in, right? That God has decided to save a people for himself. And so I would just say that's, that I don't know why that would be something that's contested. I think you affirm that too. Well, again, it doesn't have to do with is God able to turn a bad thing into a good thing? We both agree that he can, right? Again, none of this indicates or leads me to believe that God made a bad thing simply to see how he would handle it. it well, it wasn't that he made a bad thing. It was that he created the world with the intention of the fall happening so that mankind would recognize in time their need for God that they did not have before. It's only when you have the fall of man and our rebellion to his law that you can then see your need for him, apart from which you have no understanding of such things. And so that's why God on Calvinism has decided to plan the fall. It's not that he made the fall happen. It was that he planned for the fall such that in time we would see our fallenness and cling to Christ. And that's what we've done, right? We've seen our fallenness and we've recognized how hopeless we are outside of Christ. And we clinged on to him for dear life. And that's exactly what we've done as Christians. Because we realize we are without hope. It is only in Christ that there's peace and hope and all those things. So that's, that's how I would respond to that i think <clears throat> that's exactly why he's done it i just don't think that he is making it happen in the way that you're articulating it well you're moving further and further away from calvinism well see predeterminism my understanding and i may be wrong in, in, in what that means is that not only did God know that the fall would happen, but he decreed the fall to happen. Yeah. And that's what we mean by the plan. So when we say that he has decreed what's overcome the past, it means that he has planned all of time itself. Essentially, it's just an assertion that God has created time. Like, we, we believe that God is the creator of time. Right, He's created time, and time just is every interval from the beginning of time to the end of time. And so everything within that framework has been created by him. That doesn't mean he's the one committing sin or anything like that. It means he's planned everything to happen the way that it does such that his purposes are accomplished in that creation. I think a simpler way to kind of try to understand this is 
a fork in the, uh, a fork in the road. Is that the term when the road is one road and then it splits into two? Mm -hmm. Right. So I would say that you have a road that splits into two. I would say, yes, God made the one road. God also made the road that splits into two. God knows where the left goes. God knows where the right goes. And this goes on forever, right? Every road is going to have forks in the road forever and ever and ever. What I'm saying is that the individual who is walking on that road, it doesn't matter if they go left or right. God's glory is going to be shown regardless versus trying to say that God made it so that you pick the left or pick the right. Well, well, here's the thing, though. You have to remember on the Calvinist view, for us, we believe in total depravity. So we believe that if you're going to take that fork in the road analogy, left way is in rebellion to God. The right way is in union with God, you know, to, to pursue godly things. Or you could say in the spirit and in the flesh if you want. Right. This way is in the flesh, this way is in the spirit. <clears throat> we would say that the person who is unregenerate, the person who has not been born again, will always choose the left road no matter what. And it is only by God's intervention that they that their road would change from in the flesh to in the spirit. It's only when God intervenes and raises us to life that we then live in the spirit. And so the road changes from left to right. That's our position. And so it's not that there aren't two roads that we're choosing. <clears throat> it's that we will only choose one road unless God is merciful and gracious to us. So what is your, go ahead. What would you say is your best proof text to show that God decrees whatsoever comes to pass? Not whatsoever comes to pass, but God decrees the unregenerate person to continue in sin. And show me in the Old Testament. Well, would you agree that if he decrees whatsoever comes to pass, that would include the unregenerate person to continue in sin? Because that would be part of whatsoever comes to pass, right? Whatever is happening is part of his decree. Sure. So, Show me that. Uh, Let's go to Psalm 33. Uh, Psalm 33, verse 9. Let me see if I can get this up on the screen so our viewers can see it. Here we go. Okay. I don't know how well you can read that, but let me see if I can zoom this in. Oh, well, that's big X. <laughs> but this says in Psalm 33, verse 9, <clears throat> For he spoke, and it was. He commanded, and it stood. Yahweh nullifies the counsel of the nations. He frustrates the thoughts of the peoples. The counsel of Yahweh stands forever. The thoughts of his heart from generation to generation. That passage... I believe is a very strong text that affirms the eternal decree because it says for he spoke and it was right. This isn't referring to his, his law, right? Because when he's talking about his law, 
his law is broken all the time all the time right we we always break god's law yeah he says he commanded and it stood fast so whatever he commanded happened the way that it, he wanted it to it's very similar to when he says in genesis let there be light he spoke let there be light and it was right and he continues oh. to say Yahweh nullifies the counsel of the nations and frustrates the, the thoughts of the peoples. So there's a contrast between the counsel of the nations and the thoughts of the peoples versus the counsel of Yahweh and the thoughts of his heart from generation to generation. Uh, the reason why I'm emphasizing this contrast is because the picture that's given of this speech or this decree is that it's our will and our desires and our counsel that are being frustrated and nullified in this decree and it's Yahweh's counsel his desires you know the, the thoughts of his heart from generation to generation that that speaks of God's desires from generation to generation literally forever right that's just a that's a phrase that expresses eternality and so i would say that this is eternal he has decreed whatsoever comes to pass and in so doing he's nullifying our will and our thoughts and plans <clears throat> but accomplishing his own in every generation. I would say that's a very strong text. We could look at another one too, but I want okay. to focus on so, this one first. So according to that, God commands something and then it happens, right? Yes. Okay. So in Numbers chapter 20, um, verse 6, Moses and Aaron went from the assembly to the entrance of the tent of the meeting and fell face down, and the glory of the Lord appeared to them. The Lord said to Moses, right, so this is a command here, take the staff and you and your brother, Aaron, gather the assembly together. Speak to that rock before their eyes, and it will pour out its water. Okay. Mm -hmm. So God commanded something here. And then what happens? So Moses took the staff from the Lord's present as he had commanded him, right? So there we have that again, command. Yeah. Um, he and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock. And Moses said to them, listen, you rebels, we must bring you water out of this rock. Must we bring you water out of this rock? It's a question. Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out, and the community and their livestock drank. Yeah. So if God commands that Moses talk to the rock, then... You've now created this God that you accuse me and you guys laugh at me for saying, oh, God tries, and you laugh at me about that. But here God tried to tell Moses to do it one way, and he obviously failed because Moses did it another way. Now, I don't understand. Well, God had to allow it to happen that way so that the rock could represent Christ or whatever other explanations but this is a clear example of god commanding something that didn't happen then it would go against psalms okay well i i believe this is a equivocation though because remember what i said it couldn't be his commands and his law those are broken every day and i i said that when we were going through psalms right psalm 33 his commands are broken all the time. 
it's that this command in Psalm 33 is never broken because this command is the eternal decree. So whatsoever comes to pass is what's being accomplished. The text you're reading here in Numbers 20, this is command in his law. And so he he's commanding them to do something and they're being rebellious to it. And that's perfectly consistent with the fact that we are sinful creatures and we do not listen to God. That's not evidence against the eternal decree because according to Psalms, even there, even though they're being disobedient, they're accomplishing the desires of Yahweh's heart. He wanted them to do that so that the rock could function as a, as in, as a foreshadow of Christ, what Christ would be, right? And so <clears throat> that's my point. It's consistent. It's only when you demand that Psalm 33 be about commands in his law that there then becomes a problem because obviously his commands in his law are broken every day. And this is just another example of that. But Psalm 33 isn't about his law. Right? It's it's about nullifying our thoughts and our desires and accomplishing his thoughts and his desires in every generation. That would include this one. And that would include the generation that Moses and Aaron were in in Numbers 20. And so they did the desires of his heart. So you're referring more to commands like the creation, right? And so <laughs> what I'm referring to is the creative decree. When God created the world, he also created time. And in that time, you have everything that would happen in time. And that is all created according to his own will. That's why in the London Baptist Confession of Faith, it says he is decreed by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will, determine whatsoever comes to pass. And so that's all that that means. It, it just means that God has created time and everything that happens within time is according to his own pleasure. He wants to accomplish everything that he desires in his creation. And that's exactly what Psalm said he did. So, but the, the, the original question was, Show me an example in scripture that indicates that God decrees, de decrees the degenerate to live in his ways, right? So when I take you to an example in Numbers that deals with an individual and him acting according to his flesh, according to his own nature, according to what I, I'm going to do, what I want to do, I don't care what God said, then right. you turned around and said, no, well, then the, the command that whatsoever God says will be doesn't apply to the individuals. So well, no. I, I, I feel like that kind of yeah. creates a problem. I remember that's not what I said, though. What I said was <laughs> they are disobeying God's command there. What they were not doing was disobeying God's decree. God's eternal decree, which was what I was establishing in Psalm 33, that is not something you can obey or disobey. What you do is the byproduct of his decree. You can't disobey the decree because everything you do is from his decree. And so what that text was talking about in Numbers doesn't have anything to do with the eternal decree. It's referring to his specific command there for him to do what God told him to. And they were disobedient to that. They were not saying that God didn't eternally decree this. So 
Okay, we'll look at another example. Sure. For, and we'll probably uh, wrap it down after this one. Um, sure. Went about an hour here. Um, so, from the Calvinistic, Calvinist perspective, mm -hmm. God shows mercy on who he shows mercy. Now, okay. we have a city called Nineveh. Mm -hmm. right? And this city was on the path to damnation. Yeah. And their only hope, according to how scripture lays it out, is that this man Jonah would go to the city of Nineveh and preach to them to repent. Mm -hmm. Now, what happened? Uh, well, you're talking about Jonah, right? Yeah. He fled. He tried to okay. flee and, and not go to Nineveh. Okay. So. So he was going against God's command to him to go to Nineveh. Yeah. Well, the, right. The, the final, the ultimate decree is that, the, that Nineveh is going to be saved. That's the ultimate decree. Right. But the right. decree includes him going to flee from Nineveh. The eternal decree would include him trying to flee and him eventually being brought back to Nineveh, where he would eventually go to Nineveh anyway, even though he didn't want to. That's part of what Psalm 33 was about, where he is nullifying our wants and desires and accomplishing his own. That's that's a perfect example of what I'm talking about in the eternal decree. That he is nullifying even Jonah's own will. He doesn't want to go. And yet God brought him back and drew him to Nineveh so that his purposes would be fulfilled in saving Nineveh. I would argue that there's a realization that, you know, trying to go against what God has asked you to do will never work out. Yeah. And, and I would say that if God's eternal decree was to save Nineveh, then he would have had a plan B. Because the thing is that with this particular position, you're not just nullifying the the desire of Jonah to run away from the calling that God has made from him, you're also nullifying the desires of the men on the boat. They didn't mm -hmm. want to throw him forward. Yeah. They did everything before he even got to that point. Right. And that's exactly what Psalm 33 was saying, though. Right. It says he's frustrating their... He's frustrating their desires and nullifying their plans and their counsel. They planned this to happen, and yet the Lord nullifies it, doesn't allow it to happen, and his plans are accomplished. And we know this very well, brother, because we it happens to us all the time. We make plans, and you know, my my plan before last year, my plan was you know, to to try to pursue ministry. And I, I realized I'm not called for it. And the, the Lord took that desire away from me, where I, I no longer want to be a minister unless the Lord makes it clear to me that he wants me to be one, that I, I can do nothing else than to be a minister. Okay? So for me... I had a desire. I had a plan. I'm going to pursue ministry. And the Lord took it away from me. The Lord frustrated my will and my desires and my plans and accomplished his own in my life. He's constantly doing that with us. Where our plans are being frustrated and his, his plans are being accomplished. But when we finally realize what his plans are, they are always so much better than ours, right? 
<laughs> right? Like, I, I didn't, I wanted to be in ministry so bad that I was seriously trying to pursue it. But at this point, I realized why the Lord took that desire away from me. Because God wanted me to go to the Philippines. He wanted me to go to the Philippines to marry my fiance, praise the Lord, <laughs> and and pursue evangelism out there, where I can go out there and and do things for the Lord there, instead of pursuing pastoral ministry out here. Now I can finally see why the Lord took it away from me, and it was so much better because. If I had pursued that, I wouldn't be where I am today. And so I, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing when we realize that he's frustrating our plans because he has a better one. Mm -hmm. So does that make sense? I hope that can just clarify a little bit about my view. That's what I believe. I still don't agree, but I, I know... I know I I use the thing is John that you know I usually understand where you guys are coming from. I understand I I it, it almost immediately becomes very clear how and why you believe what you believe. I just yeah. agree. That's just that's just the bottom line. Like the other day on Beckwith's channel, it's like, well, Revelation, it, you know that the knocking on the door is referring specifically to the church of Laodicean and and it's like okay good like that's it like if we if you want to read through the whole chapter and 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 try to point out how you got to that understanding great that's fine no worries but it to me it's like you know as i mentioned before i don't care how you got the sausage like I, it's it's cool like it, i i don't want to dwell too much on how you got to what you believe but rather what is it that you believe and then let's work backwards yeah you know? i i would just say this brother you know i love you man so it if it ever came across the wrong way brother i promise i apologize i i didn't mean any animus against you there or anything but um the reason why i really wanted to go through revelation context is because I think exegetical dialogue is a, is a lot more fruitful than theological dialogue, in my opinion. And so there is a difference between those. Theological dialogue is when you're dialoguing about your different theological perspectives and saying, well, this is what I believe, that's what you believe, we disagree. Whereas exegetical dialogue is digging deep into the word and seeking to interpret the text consistently in its context. And when you do that, that's when you can start seeing the holes in either position. If someone is mishandling the word, you can point that out, right? So for example, you affirm the Trinity, right? Yes. So that's something you and I can agree on. So you and I can go to John chapter 1 with a Unitarian, for example, someone who denies that Jesus is the, is God. And we can go to John chapter 1, we can walk through the text with them. <clears throat> and as soon as they say, well, it says the word is a God. It doesn't say he's the God. We'll be like, wait a minute, that's not what it says, though. It says the word was God. And we can get into um, into those types of things. But that's the fruitfulness of exegetical dialogue. You can start to see why they're coming to their conclusions and show why those don't come from the text. And so for me, I think exegetical dialogue is a lot more fruitful than theological dialogue. I'm fine with having theological dialogue. I think they can be fruitful too. Mm -hmm. I just think that exegetical dialogue will get more into the meat of why we disagree. We disagree more because of our interpretations than our overall theological 
framework. Mm -hmm. And so, no, does that make good. sense, brother? We got to do another 5v1 uh, covenant, <laughs> Josh. Uh, scream off later. Brother, I, I apologize if that came out the wrong no, way. It, it's all, it's all, I'm, it's all I'm typically that one. Yeah. Right? I'm typically the one. Yeah. You typically are the one, one versus nine <laughs> surrounded by. So I commend you for being willing to do that. Yeah. So I, I'm very appreciative of you. I, if it came across wrong in any way, brother, I will personally apologize. Yeah. Like I promise, I had You're no good. will into anything. Good. I, I love, I love all you guys, Veco. I like, I like Ryan. Ryan's a cool guy. Yeah. yeah. But thank you for joining, brother. Um. Hopefully we can do another one soon, man. I would really love to do another one. And maybe yep. we can pick up on that Faith Plus Works thing because I do want to hear your answer to Romans 4. But we will get to that next time. <laughs> but, um, All right. It's been fun, man. Love you, man. I look forward to seeing this premiere and take care. You too, bro.